Well, good morning, Elvis. How did you sleep today? Excellent. Well, hello, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. I hope you're all having a great day. Today, what I want to do is, first things first, I need to go hit the post office and mail a few things out to you Patreons. I am a little late this month. I apologize. And then I want to go over to Forest Lawn um, over in Glendale because I want to go visit a guy who is widely not known today. Most people wouldn't know the name John Gilbert um, in the silver screen or silent screen era. Nobody would even know that name now, but in his day, he was the biggest male leading movie star there was. He was bigger than Valentino. His movie, The Big Parade, was the second highest grossing uh, film of all time. And he was known as the great lover in those days. Now, many people don't remember him, but I want us to go visit the grave of the great John Gilbert. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. We are of course going to the infamous Hollywood post office. What I have oftentimes referred to as my arch nemesis of this town. So today's vlog is also going to be a special Patreon sunglass vlog for Becca Clark. Becca, I hope you enjoy this vlog. All right, here we go. Here goes nothing. Actually, the last two times I've been here haven't been too painful. Good grief, I feel like I was just in a Carol Burnett sketch. There was no line, there wasn't a soul in line, but when I went in there, there was an employee in there with a broom chasing around a pigeon that was inside. And uh, they're trying to figure out how to get rid of this pigeon and everything, and I, all of a sudden, another pigeon comes flying in, so now we got two in there. I look at the guy behind the counter and I say, hey, maybe having all the doors in the post office propped open right now isn't the best idea. <laughs> and right when I say that, a third pigeon comes flying in, so it turned into, Offered Hitchcock's the birds in there while I was mailing stuff out. But anyway, let's go hit the Forest Lawn Glendale Cemetery. So how I got into John Gilbert and how I found out about him was I used to take the public bus to work and so I was an avid reader and every time I would read an old bio of anybody from the 1930s, they would always mention that they were warned about screwing with the studio and everything and they would use John Gilbert as an example of how your career could be ruined. Sadly, John was also used as an example of someone who the studio completely destroyed his life once they destroyed his career because he became a full-blown alcoholic and died of a heart attack at the age of 38 years old. Nope, not a joke. That road is called Chevy Chase. Even though I've been here a million times, he's always a tricky grave to find. You'll see, it's nothing elaborate or anything. It's just up on a hill on a slant, but it's kind of hard to find sometimes. All right, we're here, Forest Lawn Cemetery. Actually, as soon as you enter, I mean, he's right here. So he's right up here, right off to the right. As soon as you kind of enter, you just have to park and walk up this hill and he's on the side. So let's start working our way up this hill and see if we can't find Mr. Gilbert's final resting place. It's really sad for a guy who made so much money and shared so much money with so many people generously. At the end, he didn't have much. And it was his girlfriend, Marlena Dietrich, that was the one responsible for getting him a plot. Didn't even have a headstone. As you make your way over, it's this one over here kind of in solitude by itself. And John had the typical Hollywood childhood story terrible childhood his mother and father were both in the theater his mother was a performer and his father was a director producer they didn't work out and so she left him with pretty much anyone that would watch him while she went off and would perform in plays and he really ended up hating her for this At the age of six years old he would be left with a woman who quote unquote was a seamstress and her daughter but they actually were running a brothel prostitution house that's the kind of life he was raised with now this ended up having a definitive effect on john's view on women and not maybe in the way that you might think you might think this is a guy who's going to end up hating women no he hated her he vehemently hated his mother but he loved all other women and that became a problem because he would fall in love with women at the drop of a hat and sometimes 
believe that every woman he met that he fell for was a was a sign and I remember one of the earliest stories was when he was performing as a background actor for Tom N studio on uh, Santa Monica Beach that's where that was originally located and that's where he kind of got his start in the movies he fell in love with a young actress told her he was in love with her and declared everything and then decided he didn't love her and met someone new and when he was trying to think of how he could tell this poor girl that he didn't love her anymore and that he didn't want to be with her the day that he decided to do it they were filming a scene a big background scene and she was staged to be on a balcony on the second or third floor of a building and when they went to film it they uh the prop department hadn't made the um the set strong enough for as many people as they had on there and they ended up having a tragedy and she was one of the only deaths and he ended up feeling really bad about this because he was extremely relieved when it happened and he was also heartbroken because he felt that he had caused this he had felt that him wishing that something would intervene where he didn't have to be the bad guy that this would this was somehow his fault now John was extremely likable on a set and the directors and all the people that worked on the set, all the other actors, everyone could tell he was a smart guy because he was schooled. He was eventually uh, put into a military academy and he got a good education. He was a very, very well read, very well thought out guy and he ended up getting promoted to being a writer for some of these movies and one of the uh, people that he would be writing these movies for, Maurice Turnier, would like him so much that he would get him a contract to be an actor in these movies that they were making. So John had a steady income, they put him under a contract even though it wasn't a whole lot of money for um, nowadays it was like 16 or 18 dollars a week in those days that was quite a bit of money to live on not to mention it was a steady income and they guaranteed once you're under contract they would give you bigger parts and bigger things that would make you a bigger star this led him to um, eventually getting a contract with fox and fox at this time didn't realize that he was so gifted as an actor he really could bring um things to life with his facial expressions. However, he would be known later for this mustache, this great debonair mustache. He kind of had this John Barrymore look, but he didn't have that in those days. And people said that he wasn't that attractive. He was somewhat, his face was somewhat disproportionate, um, or at least to look at it, the beauty of it was. But he was so charming that he constantly was, you know, involved with women. And he was, he's a hard guy to describe because he was not a um, he's not a guy that you would want to marry but he was a guy who showered you with attention could tell you how much he loved you and um, and and he would mean it it's just that he loved so many people that he met that he just had to spread the love and he would uh, you know during times he married Latrice Joy who is a pretty established actress in those days and they had a daughter together who wrote this book and there's a significance for me bringing the book other than just you having a visual of him while we talk about him but he tried to be a husband to her and he just he couldn't quit philandering and um and she put up with it for quite a while because he was a good provider but she she knew that this was going to be the case she fought him on this the whole time he was trying to um, get her engaged. In fact, I remember one of the stories when he had a house in Laurel Canyon, he was always trying to get Latrice to marry him and he um, was asking her while they were driving through Laurel Canyon and had a ring and she said, John, I just, I can't marry you. And he got so mad that he just threw the ring out the window. That was the kind of guy he was. He did a lot of things and just kind of fits. And he went home and told his gardener what he had done and told the gardener, if you ever find that ring, I'll give you $100 for it. You know, the ring probably didn't even cost that at, at the time, who knows. But um, they said that the uh, in this book, that the gardener spent like a year every day off going out and walking along Laurel Canyon looking, searching for that ring for Mr. Gilbert. And it was really just because he wanted to, Mr. Gilbert was so good to him that he wanted to get it for, back for him just, just because he was a good guy. Now, John Gilbert was rising in stardom and once he went to MGM he completely blew up he became a full-fledged star 
he was doing movies with Mae Murray and Renee Adore, and he was really making monumental things. He was in The Count of Monte Cristo and The Wolfman, The Big Parade, um, The Merry Widow. He was just doing Heart of the Hills with Mary Pickford. His stardom was rising, and he got paired up to do Flesh and the Devil with um, the great, great Swedish actress. That's right, Miss Greta Garbo, the one that everyone now claims to be the most elusive of all elusive actresses, the woman who was never married, the woman who spent years in solitude. She loved John Gilbert. They started working together and she was amazed by his uh, brilliance. And when she had a difficult financial time, he insisted on helping her and she said, no, I will not accept your help unless you allow me to pay you back. And he said, okay, fine, then you can pay me back. And so when she did pay him back, he laughingly called her the Queen of Finland and said that it was because Finland was the only country that paid repaid its debts after the war. And they were planned to get married numerous times. He would propose, she would say yes, they would set a date and then she would cancel it or they would get into a fight and then they would cancel it. Or they would have it planned at a friend's house and she wouldn't show up. And this was hard on John because you know, he really, really did love her. They connected on a level that most people can't even fathom. And they said really that that was, he was the love of her life. When his whole career went down in flames because of Louis B. Mayer, she was the one that put him in a movie with her to help revive his career. But they had this storied, crazy love affair. I mean, only in Hollywood, you know, that they could respect each other so much and yet bicker and she just really didn't want to make a commitment I think it's not that she loved anyone beyond him but she just didn't she just didn't want a commitment in her life like that and so he would go on to be married a total of four times and have you know two children but he was a star and he had this ironclad contract with MGM that was made before Louis B. Mayer was involved in MGM. And Louis B. Mayer decided to run things much, much differently at MGM when he took over. And one of the things that he wanted to do was he was trying to take away the power of the stars, put it back in the hands of the studio. And John Gilbert had this, like I said, an ironclad $250,000 contract that nothing could be done with. And so John Gilbert really got to call his own shots. Now these two guys couldn't have been more different. Uh, Louis B. Mayer was, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, a mama's boy. He loved his mom and he did not have a problem talking about how much he loved his mom. And while John Gilbert hated his mom, he had nothing good to say about his mom. And in so many different ways, they just clashed. John Gilbert thought that Louis B. Mayer was insulting to talent. He thought he was insulting to women. He thought he treated people like garbage. And John Gilbert was exactly the opposite. And one night there was a party up in, uh, I believe it was Beverly Crest, and John Gilbert was told that he needed to be at the party because it was gonna be full of investors and MGM honchos and that they wanted to impress people by having some of the stars there. So John had his driver drop him off at this house and when he went in, he said it looked like a brothel, it looked like a meat market, it was all these, these uh, businessmen with all these poor girls standing around like they were just being ready to be, you know, slaughtered, you know, just standing around men ogling them. And basically he saw what was going on was that all of these poor background extra starlit, beautiful women were forced to be there to basically be prostitutes for these men. And John said, I'm not gonna partake in any of this this is disgusting and you're all disgusting for, for being a part of this. And directed it at Louis B. Mayer and Louis B. Mayer got in his face and they started arguing and said, how dare you speak to me that way? And uh, John Gilbert called him an SOB and Louis B. Mayer got mad and said, don't you ever talk about a mother like that. Mothers are the most precious things in the world. They're the reason that anyone matters and why anyone's here. And John Gilbert said, my mother was a whore and I don't care about mothers and I don't care about you and what's going on, and he, and it was because he had seen one of these girls on his set. He recognized one of them, he knew, that's why he knew what was going on here, and he got so mad that he walked home from this party, and Louis B. Mayer vowed that night to destroy John Gilbert's career by any means necessary. And when talking pictures would come about, he would get his chance. So what Mayer decided to do was he decided 
uh, when the talking pictures came out, he told Douglas Shearer, many people have corroborated that he told Douglas Shearer, the man who uh, did the sound on all of the movies in MGM for those days, to take out all of the bass of it of his voice, turn up the, the treble on his voice, and even out the mid so that when John Gilbert talked, he would have somewhat of a non-masculine or non-leading man type voice and this is a guy who had dominated the box office for many many years and this was an attempt to make him look like less than a man and unfortunately the reviews kind of claim that that worked for those days that one movie made John Gilbert box office poison. They said people actually laughed in the theater and John there is recording of his voice speaking you can hear it on YouTube. He had a pretty baritone voice. There was no issue there. However, this was detrimental to him and also the feeling that Louis B. Mayer had won really destroyed John Gilbert and he took everything to the max. He was drinking heavily. He was a hardcore smoker already. If you want to add insult to injury, he was friends with John Barrymore and was spending many nights up at Barrymore's house partying with people so you know that what was going on up there was not church service, it wasn't Bible study. So he was living a hard life. And like I said earlier, Greta Garbo, this uh, Swedish sensation, wanted to help revive John's career because she always believed that he was the finest actor that she ever worked with, that he was the smartest man. And so she wanted him to be in Queen Christina. And so they did, um, do that they did allow him to be in the movie but it didn't do much for his career and at the same rate Greta also uh, forced the studio to give John another chance by making a movie that he could revive his career with and Louis B. Mayer again would find a way to sabotage him while not being completely obvious I'll tell you what I mean Mayer decided to assign John Gilbert to a sailors movie co-starring Wallace Beery. Now, the one time Wallace Beery was the highest paid actor um, at any studio. And so it wasn't that this was gonna be a failure because he had bad talent to work with. It was that Wallace Beery was a well-known a-hole. And what I mean by that is he was always known for just being really despicable to people. Um, I remember one of the child actors that he worked with saying that he hated working with Wallace Beery because Wallace Beery used to like poke him in the sides or like would would stab him in the side with a pen while they were doing scenes just like like a bully and same thing on this movie what you would think would help John Gilbert's career putting him in a movie co-starring Wallace Beery Wallace Beery decided to prank John Gilbert on the set and when everyone knew that John was a struggling alcoholic who was trying to reform, they had a standing order that there was to be no liquor on the set and that even though there would be uh, partaking in the movie, they would have um, what looked like the alcohol, it would actually be tea. And Wallace Beery was spiking the tea. He was pouring booze into the tea and unknowingly while they were doing the scenes, John Gilbert would be doing the scene and not want to break the scene, but he would notice the taste was different and then eventually he would be drunk and then it would make him look like he was an unprofessional actor. And so this just led even further down the spiral. John Gilbert would eventually start dating the great Marlena Dietrich and she saw the same thing in him that Greta Garbo did and tried to help his career and just nothing seemed to work. He was just too far gone at that time. His body had completely deteriorated from all of the abuse over the years and really this guy just had a broken heart. He loved more than anything performing and making something memorable on the screen and that was all taken away. Everyone that he loved he felt looked down upon him because he had so much pride in himself. And in the end, like I said when we were driving out here, I found out about him because he was constantly mentioned in books, you know, when they would tell Clark Gable that they were going to make him a star, they would, they would say, you're going to be the next Gilbert. You know, that's how big of a name he was, that he was referenced that way. And then also, when someone decided they wanted to take on the studio, when Clark Gable decided he was going to do his own thing at times and not follow studio policy, people would remind him, you saw what happened to Gilbert, you don't want to end up like Gilbert dead at 38. Now the reason I brought this book out here is because 
when I got this book, when I started getting into John Gilbert, this was really how I got more into him. I read those little cliff notes about him, but I got this book and started reading it. I loved it. And then I started dating a girl and I was telling her how much I loved the book and what an interesting guy he really was and that I couldn't believe nobody knew his name. And so she asked if she could borrow it. And I said, sure, you can borrow it. And I forgot that I loaned it to her. And after about two months, she called me and said, I have a birthday present for you. Actually, it was a Christmas present. She said, I have a Christmas present for you. I feel so bad. Can I give it to you today? And I said, sure. So when we met up, I had totally forgotten that I loaned that to her and she comes walking out to the car with that in her hand and she said, I know this isn't your copy, but there's a reason. I felt so bad that I had your book for so long and that you hadn't asked for it because you're just a nice guy. She goes, I felt so bad that I, I decided I want to see if I could find Latrice Joy Fountain who wrote this book who was John Gilbert's daughter. And um, she said, I found her on at the time, MySpace. She said, I found her on MySpace, friend requested her, and I told her what a big fan you were and how you saw a lot of yourself in John's personality, like good and bad in that. Um, and she really liked that. And so she um, told me to send the book of yours. And then when she got it, she said, I don't want your friend to have a library copy because I had bought a copy that was once a library issued book. And Latrice said, I want him to have one of my copies. And so she signed this book with a message to me and gave me one of her copies. So I want to share it with you guys. Because like I showed you when we got up here, he's just here by himself. No family, no friends, no nobody around. But let me show you what she wrote as the inscription in this book because it really, really hit me hard when I saw it. To think that this was his daughter who sent me this. It says, to Jordan Lee with gratitude for his interest in my father's career. He would be amazed and honored to be so appreciated by young people 70 years after his death. Gratefully yours, Latrice Gilbert Fountain, December 22nd, 2009. Riverside, Connecticut. She has since passed. I looked her up two or three years ago and she's passed away. So it means even more to know that his daughter, who he showered with attention, and, and in the book she says he was a fantastic father. He really was the most loving father. You could ask him anything, he would explain things, he would take time. He treated children as equals and never talked down to them. Really cool to see that she thought enough of my interest in her father that she would do something like this. And so, that's why I like keeping his memory alive any way I can when I do silent movie vlogs or anything, I like to mention what a sad story, but what a great guy he was and what an interesting actor. He just, man, his childhood screwed him up and he was just never able to be a one woman man. And in the end, he ended up here kind of alone, you know? Now he's not buried below here he, uh, he didn't have that much money in the end, and so they cremated him. And there was no real plan for a burial spot for him, so Marlena Dietrich was the one, as I told you, up the, on her way up the hill, that she stepped up and made sure that he had a headstone and that he had a final resting place that people could come and honor him, like we're doing today. If you want my recommendation, I highly recommend The Big Parade. I love Renee Adore and she's a great co-star to him in there and you really get to see his charm and why he was one of the best. Uh, also, Flesh and the Devil with Garbo was a really popular movie. Um, I don't particularly like it that much, but they did make three movies together. Um, Love was all also pretty decent, so anything that John Gilbert's in is worth checking out. Goodbye, great lover of the screen. And Greta Garbo never ever did marry anyone. Wow, what a neat fountain. All right, let's head out of here. How was our wrestling match? You and I just battled pretty hard, didn't we? Did we fight? We did, didn't we? You wanna say hi to everybody? If I don't show you in the video, they get upset. Look at that face. Look at that face! Joster.
Joster! Alright my friends, I hope you enjoyed a little bit of old Hollywood. I mean, we're talking beginning of the great days, back when it was silent movies, right before it changed over to the talkies. That was some really great talent that came out of those times. I want to thank Mary Hendricks, Nancy Fernandez, Janet Matthews for all making some contribution to my channel. Thank you so much for helping this channel to always grow and for us to get to do more and see more places. Have a great night everyone, we'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great night and goodbye!